I've heard lots of stories from my friends with kids about times where they've had to talk to their child's teacher. In one instance, they felt their child hadn't been treated right in a particular situation, while in another, they felt their kid could be pushed a bit more in the classroom, or they wanted to make the teacher aware of a challenging situation that was happening at home that might affect how their kid behaved in school. What strikes me about many of these situations is that my friends felt empowered to have these types of conversations with their children's teachers or school administrators. But not all parents feel this way. Some aren't native English speakers or aren't college educated or feel intimidated or simply can't take time off work to make it happen. That got me thinking, what would have to change to let all parents have this opportunity to talk with their kids' teachers and the school more broadly. I'm Madhu Bakanola. This is TED Business. Our speaker today is J. Lim, the founder of Talking Points, an educational technology nonprofit. This organization helps remove systemic barriers, creating effective, equitable family engagement so that every student thrives. In this talk, you'll hear about the key ingredient that Hijay believes can remove language barriers and foster meaningful connections between families and their schools. Then after the talk, as a little treat, I've invited my dear friend, Shani Dowell, who also runs an educational technology company, to share insights on additional tools schools and families can use to have a healthier relationship. But first, a quick break. I'm eight years old, and it's my first day at the new school. But I cannot express myself. Actually, I don't understand a single word of English. My family just moved from Korea to England. My mom is raising my little sister and me, and she's also finishing her degree. She's nearly as lost as I am, but with the little English she knows, she speaks to my teachers in broken English every day about how she can help me at home. Compared to many other parents in the school who speak no English at all, or even scared to ask the questions, she's much better off. And for that, I'm much better off. Fast forward three months. Every time my mom picks me up, a swarm of Korean parents crowd around the car. It causes a traffic jam, like every day, seriously. All the other Korean parents gather around the car, asking my mom the same questions that she asked my teachers. What is um, parent-teacher conference again? My kid is behind. What can I do? I don't know how I would have survived that first year without my mom. But I do know that my experience is not that unique. But it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, research says that for a student to do well, a family's engagement is more important than that family's wealth. A parent is a child's first teacher, and children spend 80% of their waking hours outside the classroom. So no wonder families are the game changer. So here's a trillion dollar question. How can we better tap into the incredible potential of families and their universal love for their children? This is why the organization I founded helps teachers, families, and schools connect using something that we all have, a mobile phone. Teachers write the communication in English, and parents receive it in their own languages, and vice versa. We break down the language barrier, bridge cultural and knowledge differences by explaining education concepts, and enable and prompt parents and teachers to talk to each other. We're playing the role that my mom played for the school and my friends' families, the communicator, the translator, the coach, the explainer, and the go-between. And since my mom cannot be everywhere, and in fact, no parent can, and that is not for the lack of trying, we've stepped in and connected 4 million families and students and educators in 70,000 schools today. When families and schools work together, everyone wins. 
students are supported, families are empowered, and teachers' jobs just become that much easier. The school environment and community thrives with people from all backgrounds. Even the system itself benefits. Last year, the U.S. spent nearly $700 billion on school-aged education. So imagine if you can increase the return on that investment even just a little bit by connecting schools to engage with all families. And we should. It's literally a no-brainer. But actually, there's something much bigger here than student grades. Education goes beyond economic growth, and our goal goes beyond the classroom. Schools are funneled to the real world. Public education makes citizens. And in creating the next generation of citizens, we cannot be leaving behind four out of five children or their families. If we continue to pick and choose who the system engages with generation after generation like we do now, we will not be left with a community, a civil society, or even a functioning democracy. All collective well-being starts with inclusive schools and helping every child realize their endless potential. So our hope is that one day, all underserved and immigrant children and their families will feel that they belong in the education system. Our dream is that one day that they'll feel included in the very communities that they're expected to build. Thank you. It is so great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, so I'm Shani Dow. I'm the founder and CEO of POSIP. POSIP is a mashup of positive and gossip, and we help organizations hear from their communities, specifically from their families, from their students, and from their staff. So first off, I just thank you for taking out the time to uh, listen to J Lim's talk. I'm curious about what about the talk resonated with you most and why? Yeah. Part of what I think is so powerful about He Jay's talk is the power that you have in parents. So I think through her talk, she shared, I think, two important points. One is just the power of community that people found community. They talked to each other, but all of those questions and that information they had didn't actually enter the school doors. They went to where they were comfortable sharing those questions or asking that information. And then the second is the asset that's inherent in parents. Parent engagement matters more than wealth or socioeconomics in terms of student success. And so we're able to tap into the assets that parents are with their kids, with their um, schools, than just what we can unlock in terms of opportunities within our schools. Now tell us more about how the system and the process works. What happens and how are parents able to communicate with their schools and the teachers and all that? What do you do? So what we do is, you know, we work with the school or district. They say, yes, we want to hear from our community. We hear from students, staff, um, families, alumni. And so once they do that, we send out what we call pulse checks. So these are quick text message or web-based surveys that go out in over 100 languages. And it asks them a few quick questions. So we ask some sort of experience question. Are you happy? They answer yes, mostly or no. Then they're prompted for qualitative feedback, either if it's going well, uh, they're prompted to share some praise, questions, or ideas. If it's not going well, they say mostly or no, what would make your experience better? And then the partner can add their own question that's customized to, to what they're curious about. That all goes into our platform and we have technology that that categorizes it. We use machine learning to categorize it as praise or feedback and then into subcategories. So um, one's kind of like academics, the other's operations, the third is community and culture, and the fourth is, you know, staff. And then we have a team of reporters who kind of go through and make sure those are in the right categories. They identify themes and, and provide recommendations. We see what other schools or districts or organizations are doing and are able to say, here's some ideas of what to do. And I mean, we we often anchor on negative feedback. Mm-hmm. And that's usually coming from a small group of voices. Yes. And you don't get the larger perspective. So in some ways, democratizing the process of feedback, I can imagine, is a piece of what this does. But but that also makes me wonder, well, what is your goal with POSIP? Yeah. How does kind of this giving a voice um, change things and strengthen schools? And that's ultimately what we want to do is strengthen schools and have stronger organizations because so much of what makes 
schools and schooling tough is they can be unstable. They've got declining enrollment. There are a lot of questions and concerns and worries about campus safety. Academically, we've got students who are further behind than ever coming out of the pandemic. And so there's, they're both dealing with a lot of instability, but then there's also, you know, if you don't hear from parents and families and students and staff about what they need, you might have future instability. And so you can't get stronger without a strong foundation. And that's part of what we believe is if you're truly asking your people questions and can take that feedback and adjust, then you can start to have more stability. So one, you can predict better um, Mm -hmm. and and respond to things, but then also you can prevent (laughs) things from happening. A lot of the population doesn't get that opportunity every day to be asked their opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. And so how do you make sure that every person feels that their opinion can shape the institutions that they depend on for their daily lives? And so that's part of what we're hoping for on the end of parents and students and staff is to know that no matter what your language, socioeconomic level, background, that your voice matters to shaping the institutions that shape your life. So very interesting. It reminds me of just, you know, that there are lots of parents who are first gen or not college educated or as TJ was talking about, not native English speakers. Mm -hmm. And so what difference do you think POSIP makes for families of color, for children of color? We actually got this insight from one of our interns and she shared, even though my parents spoke English, they're from India. They were immigrants from India when I was in school. They were so self-conscious about their accent. They they didn't want to go to the school and talk. They would actually, they would respond via text and share everything because they don't have that barrier of sensitivity. And then a safe space to ask questions that you maybe don't know. Like, what is this parent-teacher conference? Mm-hmm. I've been in. I don't know how many parent-teacher conferences, and I still ask myself the same question. <laughs> Imagine like not having done one at all, and then what are the expectations? Right. And so having a space where people can ask those questions or at least articulate that it's something that they're wondering about is um, super powerful as well. Excellent, excellent. Do you have any examples that stick out in your mind of a time that POSIP really made a difference in a particular school? So one school-based example is we were working with a school and they served a high population of um, families who um, were working, but, you know, and so what they learned is that they they didn't have an extended aftercare program. And after hearing their feedback from POSIP, they actually they were able to create an after school program. Um, and part of what was powerful about that is they actually had the money. They just didn't know wow. that that was something that had been holding parents back. Um, and so that that's one example of both decision making as well as real changes that that right. that schools and districts were able to make based on some of the feedback they got. I love it. I love it. Shani, it has been such a treat having you here. Thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to our listeners, to be on TED Business. And thank you for all you're doing for schools, individuals, and organizations. Well, thank you. This is what I love, um, helping kind of elevate the voices of many as well as making organizations better. So thanks for having me. That's it for today. This episode was produced by Kiara Powell and fact-checked by Matias Salas. Special thanks to Anna Phelan, Michelle Quint, Corey Hagem, and Colin Helms. I'm Madhu Aginola. Talk to you again next week.